Hello, my name is BJ Paris. Welcome to Tapping Into His Treasures. I'm sitting on a different couch today because I have above me on the wall uh, a picture in puzzle form of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And this is Easter week. It's Monday, Thursday, or Holy Thursday, uh, the day before Good Friday. So I'd like you to put your attention on that uh, picture for just one moment. Christ is arisen. Happy Easter to all of you. Today we're going to talk about uh, divine orchestration. I'm going to tell you some stories today. Um, I already did a show on divine orchestration and it's just a favorite theme of mine, the stories about things that God does in our lives. So I hope I don't sound like a broken record by telling you over and over again to put your antennas up and to listen and to look and see what's going on around you that God might be trying to um, get your attention. He actually causes things to happen. He puts a spark in our lives by doing these things and they're seemingly coincidental happenings. Uh, the first one I want to share is as follows. Some of you may watch um, Who Do You Think You Are on TV and NBC. Uh, it was on Friday nights. I think it's going off the air for the summer or something, but sometimes it's on and sometimes it's not. Well, the other night they had Ashley Judd. Um, most of you know, we know in a judge, Judd's sister. And she was on looking for her ancestors. And it was so fascinating and it, it came into my life in a personal way and I want to pass that on to you just to give God the glory and for no other reason. Okay, so she was tracing her ancestors ancestors, and discovered that her great-grandfather, ten times removed, was William Brewster, also known, uh, it's B-R-U-S-T-E-R, also known as Brewster, B-R-E-W-S-T-E-R. He came over on the Mayflower in 1620. And let me just throw this in here. I'm from Maine. Everybody and his brother from Maine is related to somebody who came over on the Mayflower. So um, I don't want to bore you, but my, my four sons are in, have a relative who came over on the Mayflower also. So not to be redundant or anything like that, there's a new twist in this story that, that I thought you might like. So anyway, here she is on TV, um, and NBC went through a lot of expense. She went through a lot of uh, research, gave a lot of time and energy to the project went to Boston and to England, and uh, so anyway, back to my sons, um, Governor William Bradford, the first governor of the states, is their great-grandfather eight times removed on one of their grandparents' side and nine times removed on the other grandparent. So, Ashby went to England and found out a great deal of information about her ancestor, William Brewster. William Brewster and William Bradford, our relative ancestor, opposed the religious system in England and together were arrested for religious disobedience. She even began to cry on the uh, show because just to think that so men, the men could be so devout that they would actually uh, face imprisonment just for, for their Lord. And NBC actually televised the cell in which both men were incarcerated in Lincolnshire, England in 1607. At one point, both men were able to flee England. They spent the next 12 years hiding in Holland uh, where there was religious freedom. In 1620, they went back to England to leave for America if they could not leave from Holland. They could not go on a regular ship because they were fugitives, so they hired someone privately. That person betrayed them. They must have taken their money and everything, I would assume. After that experience is when they found the Mayflower and they sailed for America. The voyage was dangerous. Only 60% of the passengers survived. 
The names of both Williams were written on the passenger list and shown on the TV show. The book was pretty dilapidated and had to be handled with care, so the uh, Ashley Judge, Judd and the person who was uh, showing her these uh, things from the archives, they both had to wear gloves while viewing them. So back to my son's great-grandfather times eight, William Bradford, he authored the P Plymouth Plantation, which I had never known before. Uh, this book, I'm not sure it either pertained to, to Plymouth, England, or Plymouth, Massachusetts, after we got here. Now this is the part that I think was so fascinating. Just think, the show spent all that money coming up with Ashby's genealogy and tracing the family history, and with all the work and traveling that Ashley did. And all that I had to do was to sit back on my couch, this one right here that I'm sitting on now, and to recall, record all of her compiled information about William Bradford, who is our ancestor. And it all came over the TV set, and I didn't have to utilize one ounce to get the information. I mean, can you beat that, really? I never traveled a mile never spent a dime. I just laid here on my couch with my pad and my pen and they presented it all and I recorded it all. I mean, to me, that's just like God where I'm um, one of His to spare me all that expense in time and travel. He is so good and that just blew me away and I hope that you enjoy it too. I have some more um, or, uh, some more uh, testimonies, very short ones, each one's only a couple of minutes, uh, pertaining to God's orchestration in people's lives. Um, these came from the, uh, the Book of Small Miracles, and uh, it's, a, a, uh, it's from the Jewish faith, but it's one God. The first one, uh, actually there's no title to it, so I'm just going to start reading. At the age of 35, and after breaking up with my boyfriend of five years, my prospects for marriage seemed dim. Still in all, my faithful mother continued to encourage me and insisted that I would soon meet the most wonderful man whom I would eventually marry. I would nod politely as she spoke, but deep inside, I didn't believe a word she said. In the back of my mind, I would cynically think, yeah, right. My mother is a devout Catholic. Oh, I guess this one isn't Jewish. <laughs> That's nice, a combination of different backgrounds. My mother is a devout Catholic. One day while in church, she wrote in the prayer book for intentions, I hope my daughter will meet the most wonderful man to marry. This is my dearest wish. Almost as soon as my mother wrote these words, she began to puzzle over them. Every person has its own individual way of speaking, and dearest wish is not a phrase my mother is apt to use. As my mother reread her own words, she was mystified over the rather archaic language she had just uncharacteristically employed. That's strange, she thought. Why did I write dearest wish? That is not something that I typically say. That evening, my parents dined at their favorite Chinese restaurant. When my mother opened her fortune cookie, it read, Your dearest wish will come true. She told me the story with tears in her eyes. I thought it was a pure coincidence. Nonetheless, I pinned the fortune to my refrigerator door for several weeks. Three months later, I was set up. Wait a minute. Three months later, I was set up on a blind date, and I instantly knew that the man I had met that night was him. Sure enough, we were married 14 months later and have been happily married for the last eight years. That's really cool. I could see God in that right from the beginning when she wrote Dearest Wish on the prayer intention paper. Things like that happen all the time, and how we, we just glance over them and don't get it. Oh, if we could only purpose to get even the smallest things. Here's another one. 
When I told my husband David that I was pregnant, I expected a surprise surprised but happy reaction. I was sadly mistaken. The news hit him like a wrecking ball. His words were full of anger and contempt. Poor lady. Family and friends told me David probably didn't feel he was ready to become a dad. Too bad, I thought. We were ready. Aside from Dave, I was enjoying every moment of my pregnancy. What a gift. I wished Dave would share the joy with me. I had no I wait a minute. I had an idea. I had an idea I thought might work. I signed us up for a childbirth class. Dave came with me to the first class and to my delight he participated in the discussions. The following week he came home late and said he couldn't go to the class. I totally lost it. After screaming and yelling at him, I flew out of the house and went by myself, but I couldn't concentrate. When I got home, I realized that the only thing I had taken away from the class was that maybe we should look at life insurance. Dave and I agreed that life insurance was a good idea. We signed some papers and thought nothing more of it. Then Anna was born. She took over our hearts. We were consumed with love. Dave completely met metamorphosed, I used this word this morning, metamorphosed and embraced fatherhood. And then it happened. We received a rejection letter from the insurance company. Dave had failed the medical exam. He had kidney disease and needed to have a transplant. Dave's father was a perfect match and generously donated one of his kidneys. Anna, our little sunshine, saved her daddy. It is possible that Dave could have continued on unknowingly and died of kidney failure. I'm glad that God didn't wait for Dave to be ready to be a dad. Isn't that a beautiful story? So yes, God does allow things to happen. We wonder why, why, why in the turn out to be either a blessing in disguise or or something that God orchestrated to help us. Here's another one. There are four siblings in our family, all brothers, and two of us are identical twins. We always mark one another's birthdays. Since we all live in different cities, we convey birthday greetings with both phone calls and cards. This is our family tradition. This year we felt it was particularly important to remember our youngest brother, Mark. He was studying at Harvard and would be celebrating his birthday without any family nearby. I sent him a card a few days in advance of his birthday and then I followed up with a call. The card itself was not your usual birthday card. I had looked at dozens of cards before settling on one that was quite unusual, a bit off-color, and exhibiting a rather weird sense of humor. It was truly a card that Mark would appreciate, and it was clearly a card that you had to hunt for. I reached my younger brother by phone on his birthday, and he told me that he had indeed received the card. Then he said, that was a really neat stunt that you and Joel, my identical twin who then lived over 2,000 miles away, pulled with the birthday card. I didn't know what he meant, and I told him so. He laughed and suggested that I stop pulling his leg. I was completely in the dark and kept asking him to explain his remark. Finally, he answered, you know, sending me the exact same demented birthday card. Now it was my turn to be incredulous. What were the odds that two brothers living 2,000 miles apart and without any communication whatsoever, would select the identical birthday card from the thousands that are produced each year and send it to the same brother. To this day, I am still shaking my head in amazement and disbelief. Wow, can you get over that? That is truly amazing. Only God could orchestrate something like that. They're not coincidences, trust me. They're not 
It's all God in the ministry of his angels behind everything like that. Hallelujah. Okay. Earl Clough, K-L-O-T-H, a homeless man who lived in Racine, Wisconsin, was foraging in a city park one day when he unearthed a bullet. It had not been used. It was a live one. Earl shuddered with the responsibility of having uncovered such a potentially dangerous item. What if it got into the wrong hands? What might happen if the next person to encounter it was a child? Earl felt that he couldn't, he couldn't just leave it there, so he brought the bullet to the Racine Presbyterian Church, which doubles as a homeless shelter on Sunday nights, and turned it over to the officials in charge. Earl hadn't known that such a simple act as retrieving a lone bullet would require endless paperwork, forms that the homeless shelter would fill out for him and file with the Racine Police Department. It was at this juncture that a far more personal drama began to develop. Hmm, Earl Glass, an officer in the Racine Police Department, labored his mind racing as he happened to pick up the police report detailing the recovery of the live bullet. Now, where have I heard that name before? He remembered that someone named Scott Clough had called him a year earlier regarding his search for a long-lost brother. And that is how one lone stray bullet that other people would have ignored reunited two brothers in Racine. This story has a happy ending. Scott Clough convinced Earl to move to Illinois with him. He invited him to live at his home and got him a job working for one of his business partners. I never saw Earl so happy, said Donna Bumpus, the homeless shelter's director. It's amazing that what brought these two brothers together was a bullet. And who do you suppose was behind the bullet? God Almighty and his angels, the angels that were assigned to these people. Isn't that awesome? Oh, I'll read this one later because I think I read it already. We'll get back to that one if I need it. And these are some taken from my latest book, uh, some stories that I wrote uh, where I felt that God was orchestrating as well. I'm going to read, I think I'll read them to you instead of just uh, telling them to you. Not long ago, when I was visiting my friend Elaine, she asked me if I could use an octagon-shaped ma mahogany table with doors and storage space. As much as I admired the piece of furniture, I wasn't going to take it because my apartment is kind of small and I just couldn't fit anything else into my living room. As I sat next to Elaine on her sun porch that day, my cell phone rang. It was my friend Andrea calling me from Richmond, Maine. We chatted for a minute or two when I started to tell her that I would call her back when I returned home. For some strange reason, she kept talking and talking and telling me about some object that had an octagon shape. Do you get it? I was offered an octagon table that I refused, and she goes on and on and on when I'm ready to hang up about this octagon-shaped object. She went on and on using the word octagon all over and over again. I knew immediately that God was using her as an instrument to tell me to take the octagon-shaped piece of furniture that my friend offered me. And that's the only reason I took it. A few days later, when Elaine delivered the furniture to my house, I had put her, let's see, I had, I had her put it in my bedroom beside my bed instead of in the living room. I switched my white nightstand to the other side of the bed. The new mahogany furniture not only matched my desk and filing cabinets, which were situated in the corner of my bedroom, it provided ample space for numerous desk, desk items for which I had no room. For instance, all these mailers for DVDs that I used to send out uh, discs and so forth. 
Only God could provide the much needed space for my supplies in such an unusual way. And wouldn't you agree that, that was an unusual way? All orchestrated by God. And this story I thought was kind of neat. I hope you... I know you will. I know you will. It has to do with Ellis Island in New York. A Facebook friend and member of my church, Daniel, wrote and told me that he left home when he was 16 years of age. He reminded me of my grandfather, who also left home at age 16. I jotted myself a reminder to write Daniel the story about my grandfather coming to Ellis Island as a boy. Are you with me? The following morning, even before I had a chance to write Daniel, he wrote to me telling me that he had an interesting story to tell me about Ellis Island. Duh! I was going to write to him about Ellis Island that same morning, and without even mentioning it, it to him, he wrote to me about Ellis Island on the email moments before I was going to write to him about Ellis Island. I mean, things like that just don't happen. They don't happen. So let me get on with the story. Okay, the following morning, even before I had a chance to write to him, he wrote to me telling me he had an interesting story to tell me about Ellis Island. Wow, how could that be? Oh, I had a story about Ellis Island to tell him. How could he have one to tell me at the same time? Unbelievable. I wrote to Daniel telling him about my grandfather, Dominic, who, when he was a boy of 16, was walking the family's mule back to their property when the mule became stubborn and would not move. He began hitting the animal with a stick with no success at getting it to move. He then began beating the mule hard, so hard, that he broke the mule's leg. He became terrified that his father would beat him when he found out. In a nearby port, there was a ship getting ready to sail to America. My grandfather, Dominic, stowed away on the ship. He had no money and could not speak English. He probably only had enough food to fit in his pockets. He must have felt very lonely at the thoughts of never seeing his family again. After a long voyage, Dominic arrived at Ellis Island with no knowledge of the language, with no family, with no money or food. He was alone with only aspirations of a promising future in a new land. My grandfather met and married my grandmother Elizabeth when she was a girl of 16. They had 11 children and my grandfather, I mean my grandmother, lost six. They had 39 grandchildren, over 50 great-grandchildren, and only God knows how many great-great-grandchildren. There was so much love in their family. Today, many of us continue to keep in touch with one another. We are so proud of our heritage. So back to the Ellis Island. Isn't that really phenomenal how that happened? Unbelievable. And I may have shared this one before, too, but that's okay. I'll share it again. My friend Connie came to my house to spend the day and an overnight with me. We only get together for an overnighter every couple of years. She left her house in a titter, as she describes it, and forgot to bring a nightgown. She planned on sleeping in her birthday suit as none of my sleepwear would fit her. At bedtime that night, I pardon me. At bedtime that night, I happened to think about a black blouse that I had picked up at my friend's yard sale. It was two or three times my size, and I had planned to use it, the black material, to cover um, my hat, my hassock, to match my living room decor. But then I decided against it. Gee, Connie, I, I have a really nice black blouse from a friend of mine that I think will fit you. I'll go get it and you could try it on. You could use it for a nightgown. Sure enough, it fit her perfectly and she loved it. I think I'll use it for a nightgown tonight and then when I get home, I'll use it for a blouse. What a novel provision from God. Now, that is so simple, yet to me it's so profound. Do you think it's profound? I don't think I'm exaggerating. Because when you come to God, you can't be too profound. Seriously, stop and think about it. 
My girlfriend rushed out of the house and forgot a nightgown, and what do I have? You can see how small I am compared to a lot of women. I had nothing to fit her. So God provided. He's the one that put my eyes on that black blouse at the yard sale. And my friends, it was nice and clean. And had me bring it home knowing that she was going to forget a nightgown, and he probably caused the tither that she was in so that she would forget the nightgown and have to use what he provided. Because that's how he does things, because he's such a fun God. And he loves to bring spice into our lives. Yep. I don't know if I have time for one more or not. Let's see. I don't want to take a chance and, and not be able to finish it. So I'm going to end by saying, it's my wish that you take these accounts, these little short stories, into your consciousness. I want to encourage you to be alert to all that is going on around you. God may be trying to get your attention. Thanks for watching. God bless you and God bless yours and God keep you and God keep yours. And if you're watching this around Easter season, I wish you have a blessed, blessed Easter. And go to church. And instead of just going once a year on Easter, I encourage you to go every Sunday or at least more than once a year. God bless. Bye-bye.